Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Riff Hard Podcast. My guest today is the legendary Jack Owen. You know him from his work in bands like Cannibal Corpse, Deicide, and now Six Feet Under. I mean, this dude has been around, and I would call him one of the institutions of death metal. I mean, if you think Jack Owen, you think any one of these great bands. Now, uh, Six Feet Under has a new album coming out May 13th called Killing for Revenge. And uh, just side note, they have a single called Ascension that's not the same song as my band's song. So two different Ascensions, two different bands. Anyways, let's get into it with Jack Owen. Jack Owen, welcome to the Riff Hard Podcast. Hey, man. Good to be here. Good to have you. I've been a fan of your work for a long time now, so very cool to talk to you. It's, you've been kind of, I feel like you've been in like lots of bands I listened to at some point or another. Mm-hmm. So that, that, um, that makes me wonder what, how do you consider yourself? Do you consider yourself like, um, a band guy? Do you consider yourself like a session guy? Do you consider yourself just a, like, like if you were to write an about me? For Jack Owen, what would you oh, yeah. say? Well, I could put it with anybody, but I feel like a full member of Six Feet Under right now, so that's cool. Um, we're not as busy as I'd like to be, but hopefully that'll pick up. You think, uh, I mean, with the record coming out, probably tour cycles and stuff, or by busy, you mean you want to tour more often? Yeah, we should, and we're talking about a couple tour things, but nothing's confirmed yet, so maybe once the album comes out, we'll get some offers that are closer than what we're talking about, which is next year. Oh, uh, okay. Man, it's it's weird these days, isn't it? It's, uh, I've noticed, um, we, it's, we have a record coming out actually a week before you guys. It's funny. You guys have, my band's called Doth. We have a single called Ascension. Yeah. That came out a week right before yours on the same label. Not that. The yeah. comment like, section was like, is this a comment of Doth? And then the other section was, is this a cover of Six? I know. I know. It, Chris, Chris hit up our vocalist. I guess they're friends. Uh, they were laughing about it. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, but I mean, it's one of those things where, someone someone was talking shit about it in the comments but it's like well so are we supposed to check with every other band on the planet if they're using a name and then what tell another band or have another band tell us no you can't release this right crazy yeah it, yeah comment sections tell you how to write and how they want stuff written it's like okay we'll we'll do the work you just sit back and enjoy <laughs> But I, yeah, when I was running demos and stuff, I had a lot of simple titles, so we had to go around that and use lines from the song. I had like one word title, so Ascension. Our version is about Macbeth, so I guess we could have used a line from the song like uh, "Bly as in a death," which is directly from Macbeth. Interesting. That's not that's not what ours is about. So, do you think? So you say you go with one word titles at first. Yeah. Um, is that kind of like to set the vibe for what you're going to write about? Um, or is it, or do you see like lyrics separate from the music? I'm, I'm trying to understand. So you have like a title and then you write. Um, yeah, a phrase or a, a word. And then what, a, what I end up with, I just, just particularly for this album, I was like one word titles when i was done like bestial savagery is about tornadoes and i just called it tornado and I, and then chris was like why don't we call it something else i was like yeah you're right <laughs> so we called it bestial savagery which was in a song and accomplice was just accomplice on my part and chris was like accomplice to evil deeds i was like yeah much better yeah i it, that that makes sense do you write lyrics like, or do you consider yourself a lyricist? Yeah, I wrote since, uh, you know, before Cannibal and during the early days of Cannibal. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen, 
I've seen your your like name in credits for lyrics. I'm just curious, right. like, um, because some I feel like sometimes some guitar players, like myself, um, end up in lyric credits. But really, all I did was say that line sucks. <laughs> that, word, that word's stupid. <laughs> so you you actually write lyrics from like lyric lyrics. Yeah, for this one, I wrote like ninety percent of the lyrics. Um, so a couple, I ended up with a hundred percent of the lyric just because I had an idea of how they should go and started. And I have been writing lyrics for a long time. And I like to, so I had a lot of ideas. It's interesting to me. It's interesting to me just because I suck at writing lyrics. Um, like r I have no ideas for them ever. Um, like it's pure, just music for me uh is it something that you developed separately from the writing and playing or did you always see it as something that goes together i think it goes together because we were originally influenced by horror movies and uh mm -hmm. horror themed novels graphic novels comic books so a whole story went with cannibal early in the um process of the band just having the artwork, the lyric, the brutal music, and, you know, if you had a lyrical idea, just throw it in there. Interesting. I've never been able to make words sound cool. Um, uh, so so yeah, I, do. <laughs> I, I guess, so this brings up something I wanted to ask you about, um, and without any shit talking, but uh, you've been public about... Um, why you left your last band. And so one thing I wanted to talk about, like for musicians out there who are um, in similar situations or just want to set things up for themselves properly in the band they're in or band they're going to be in, um, how can musicians make sure that they're credited properly and that they've got their publishing in order, in your opinion? Yeah, if you're not comfortable with what the band is doing, then you should be in touch with the label when they're doing the credits for publishing and, and royalty selection. So, uh, you know, BSI was just a thing where I was writing music. I obviously couldn't write lyrics, but just trying to squeeze in as much music as I could. So, you know, just that one day I walked in and Steve re-recorded my song, him playing guitar, and he was probably joking. He just said, I'll change the notes so I can get writing credit. And it was dumb, but I was kind of on my way out anyway. So it was like an excuse to, to walk out. <laughs> so, I mean, it's one of those things where I feel like uh, a lot of people don't know to just hit up the label or to go to the powers that be that will actually administer the songs. I think that's actually pretty wise. Even the publishing company to make yep. sure it all go through. Yeah. I, for some reason, I feel like uh, a lot of musicians don't do that sort of thing and just will rely on other band members or what a manager says or just figure there's no solution. Yeah. Back in the day, like we didn't care. We wanted to write songs, put out albums, and go on tours. And it was like, uh, writing credit? Who cares? Let's go on tour. <laughs> so the first three Cannibal albums are literally split five ways. Like, nobody really paid attention to who wrote what. And that's about it. Do you think... Uh, I've, well, I've always thought that, like, in a band, when the band is trying to make a name, and there isn't a huge amount of income anyways. Um, people make contributions that maybe they didn't write very much, but they're making, they have to, to get a band going. They're, they'll make other contributions that maybe they won't get credit for. It like goes under the radar, but that is equally as important to a band getting off the ground. Like for instance, there could be somebody in the band that's, highly social and is the person who makes all the contacts, which then cr creates all the tours or something, or 
is the person who knows how to balance budgets or whatever, mm -hmm. but they didn't write anything. And I think that especially early on in a band, if a band is moving, um, it makes sense to split things up like that because there are a lot of roles that people have, lots of hats people have to wear that they're not going to get paid any extra for. Yeah. At drummers all. always get screwed. Yeah, for sure. Drummers they don't write any melody, but of course they're writing the drums. So I always thought, hey, that's like a part of songwriting. So it is. A yeah. I kind of like the grouplet, but you know, it's different these days because we're not even in the same state. Yeah. Write everything, demo it, and send it around. I kind of write the drums for Marco, but what he plays is way better than what I can do in Easy Drummer. Easy Drummer is pretty great, though, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I should really just write the riff or the song to a click and then let him do whatever. I think I'll do that with next one. You know, I've tried that. Like, I do that sometimes, but I don't know. Tell me if this if it works like this for you. Sometimes without an actual beat, you like it's hard to get to the full, the full sickness, the the full potential of how sick a riff could be without having like an actual drum beat to play yeah. off of. Yeah, yeah, you're not sure what the drummer is going to do because you kind of have a riff in your head, mm -hmm. or actually a beat in your head for what the what should go to the riff. Like if I'm using my riff archive, I have riffs, two drum beats, so they already have a, a beat. So yeah, I mean, I sent them a demo with the drums done, but do whatever you you feel is, is good and is comfortable. Yeah, the, the riff archive, how far back does it go? Oh, uh, 2014, I think. And how does that work? Is it just like whenever you come up with something, just record it? Yeah, I should do like a YouTube video because I have a formula of just writing out the alphabet and then writing a guitar note under each letter. And then if I'm watching TV, it's usually hockey, though so there'll be weird names or whatever that goes by. I just write down the name and I'm using the notes that are under those letters. So it's usually a a pattern that I would never think of on my own. And I'll usually I have two or three pages of that put on a, a drum thing. A easy drummer, I just did a six minute thing of like every drum beat. So put on the drums, play the note patterns that I have. Some suck, cross them out. Some are cool and and then boom, there's a MP3. And I write it down in a notepad or actually title the MP3 what the notes are. So it's pretty cool. I'm up to like 200, 250 riffs. And they still work now? Like you'll find stuff from like 2014 that's relevant now? Yeah, what I do now, what you end up with is pages and pages of, of good patterns of notes. So I'm not even really consulting the, the audio. <laughs> I'm just working with what I'm doing now and then consulting that, that note pattern and like oh that's really cool it could be like three notes it could be ten interesting okay and then that's the evolution of of that formula that i have so you would you'll look at that and find a pattern that kind of fits what you're doing or would take it to the the next place that it wasn't going before and then work how it actually sounds and how it's played to fit the context of the song yeah um whatever is in my head and um if i have that note pattern it starts in like c or whatever and then if i could go down a page and see what's in a relative minor key to that and then there's a corresponding riff and then i kind of wrote um what the tempo is for each riff i have them grouped in like slow mid thrash mm -hmm. or blast I do need to do like a, a little teaching video for that because everybody needs to have endless riffs. Yeah, man, absolutely. It's and a, and a system for archiving them is really good. I think uh, we get asked about this all the time over at Riff Heart is uh, how how do you organize your stuff? And um, 
the way I started doing it with at least with song versions is is just putting a number at the end of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that way uh, you're not confused by which version it is, and even no matter who it's going to, like if I finish a version and I sent it to Krim, Krim starting on number two. When it comes oh, yeah, back to me, I then can. it's three, and there's there's also like a date timestamp, but the date timestamp doesn't always tell the story because you might have accidentally opened an earlier version of the song that has a later timestamp, so the number at the end um, really helps at least for categorizing songs because we end up starting lots and lots and lots of songs and it, it yeah. end, end and end with like 50 versions of a song um a numbering system is kind of like the best thing i figured out but for riffs i've been trying to figure out a way to categorize riffs because like every time i practice just practice anything like a riff will just happen and so i've been recording them just as they happen and now i have like a mountain of them and I yeah. need to figure out what to do with them. Yeah. That's a different formula. Yeah. The, well, yeah, which I haven't figured out because, um, I do have them, but they're not, they're also, your formula sounds really interesting because, uh, you have the notes you played written down. So you don't have to figure anything out by ear. Yeah. And of course the, there's 26 letters of the alphabet, and of course, 12 notes are going to repeat within the the alphabet. So that's one downfall, but maybe an octave note in the riff. But, uh, you know, some riffs suck, and some are like, whoa, where did that come from? Oh, it came from this guy on my TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that makes sense, because when you record a riff for the archive, well, first of all, odds are that at least for me, it's not played that great because I have to like actually practice this stuff to be able to play it well. At the moment that it's written, it's pr it's pretty sloppy. So I have to then go and interpret the slop on the recording. Um, so so it, that that's tough. With the way that you have it, even though you don't have an audio reference, at least you have exactly what the notes are. I have notes in an archive, and uh, I'll multi-track it. So drums, two tracks of guitar, and now I even do a bass bass guitar track on it. So it's kind of tight, <laughs> and I can add a harmony guitar track. I feel like it. So do you have like a writing template? Uh, uh, no, not necessarily. Where do you track the the guitars? Uh, just in uh, a task and multi-track, just an eight track. Oh, wow. Okay. So very, very, um, very, very simple method, like nothing crazy at all. Super old school. I even have to run it into a CD burner to make it. In wow. Three. <laughs> wow. A CD burner. And then rip it into my computer, but that means I can title it. Um, have you considered learning like a DAW or is it just this works so well this works why why mess with it works it does work because I can when I rip my uh, songs or rips into CD go through my stereo and it sounds pretty good so it just worked for me I mean I use a Microsoft Zoom so I'm just old school I'm old old school but you're using Easy Drummer yep so, I need that. So are you using it in standalone? Uh, yeah. Okay. Just in my laptop. Okay, yeah. I was I was trying to understand because if you're using a Easy Drummer and a Tascam. Yeah. That well, you never... know, I just run, run the audio from my laptop onto track one of my Tascam. And then two tracks of guitar with a line six pod. And then I even use the guitar as a bass, tune through a, a bass program on the line six. <laughs> so it's it's kind of dumb, but it works for me. It's it's interesting because you're using all these modern tools. Um, yeah, and I see. You're, yeah, you're using like pitch shifters and like software. But you usually when people will demo 
with uh with fake drums like easy drummer then they'll also the record the guitars into the computer and yeah. the demos will live there yeah i should have like a multi-track program but i really don't have a lot of memory in my laptops so yeah whatever works i mean at the end of the day whatever works yeah. is what works mm -hmm. i think uh and i think that like one of the fatal flaws i see with so many musicians is waiting or until they have like the perfect rig or by somebody else's standards, not by their own standards. Like they see what someone else has and think that that's what they need to have in order to be able to produce an output at that level. And that's, that's false. It's false. I mean, if I'm going on tour, I'm taking like my crate head from God knows when through a couple of crimson cabinets, I'm using a line six floor pedal and uh my guitars are like stock pickup black hearts <laughs> so uh yeah you just do what you gotta do yeah i mean not there's there's no reason um to wait until there's a perfect scenario i think you can everybody just, had to have a kid burn yeah got to have a kid burn and go go broke <laughs> i mean it, i i think that uh there's so many affordable options anyways now that it's uh there's nothing there's nothing that should really stop you from being able to write um so do you consider yourself more of a writer or a player or 50 50 it'll be more of a writer as i wrote that last six feet under and then i wrote a whole album of stuff and then i wrote the new six feet under so Rips and songs and albums and miscellaneous crap. So uh, definitely a writer. It's where scattered throughout America, I'm just here They're using my stuff, my old stuff. And is there, uh, it, how do you balance uh, actual like guitar practice as a player in with all the writing? Yeah, just riffs and playing along to stuff that'll keep my speed up that's the main thing with me uh i have to play like almost every day just to keep the speed up in my right hand that's my main concern that man right hand that's the first thing to go yep <laughs> yeah <laughs> people are like do you play from your elbow and i'm like i don't even know what that means <laughs> if you watch kevin from dsi he plays all with his finger. He does the rotation. Yeah. I don't know what that is. It's hard to explain, but basically like you're you're basically distributing the the motion to where a lot of it is coming from your thumb and finger and rotating, which then puts less strain on the wrist and then even less on the forearm and then even less on the elbow and then even less on the shoulder. So it's just basically distributing the load and then you can get a lot of the more micro movements under control without um, using a lot of effort. So, I mean, it's really good for like the tech stuff. I yeah. Mean, I've seen lots of the tech dudes. Um, you know, Justin McKinney does it. He calls it Scoopy method, but uh, I've seen Justin McKinney do it and uh, Zenith Passage. And I don't know if the Arcspire guys do it, but it's a technique wow. that, yeah, I mean, Dude, they're insane but yeah the the ro the rotating thing definitely allows for speed without wearing out your arms and wrists so much it definitely helps with that so i can't be in there with the plane that, that fast with just your two fingers maybe i'll try it it's rotating the pick in your finger yeah kind of i can like, wrong with the joint <laughs> kind of it's kind of like it's hard to it's hard to explain without a a guitar but yeah you, you are a adding to the motion by rotating from your thumb and your index finger um, oh, um, and but it's not the full motion it's not like the rest of your arm is like frozen and they're only moving from there like you're still moving your wrist and stuff it's just uh you're it, this is adding on to it um at certain times there's certain types of techniques where it doesn't make any sense like down picking a riff or something but for tremolo picking or like string skipping or lots of alternate stuff it's very 
is useful at times. I I noticed for gallops too. I just um, I didn't play for a really long time. I I like stopped for like eight years and then came back to it and had to like relearn and um and it it was kind of interesting because that it was an opportunity to like not have all these old habits mm-hmm. that used to hold me back and so starting kind of from scratch um i like i just watched a bunch of the videos that we had put out on riff hard and took lessons from some of this like new school of sick guitar player and that rotation was one of the first things that i learned and it was really tough to do at first, but I just noticed all these dudes I know who are like hyper speed, who are just like faster than kids ever were when I was coming up. Like, yeah. what are they doing differently? And it's little things, it's little things like that to where yeah. they're doing that and then not hurting themselves. But yeah, use your fingers instead of moving your whole wrist, then I'm sure it's moving a lot less stuff when you're playing. <laughs> yeah. But I'm stuck in my ways, so I'm just anchored anchored to the pickup with my pinky wrapped around it and then just trying to go as back as possible. Well, just playing along with like razor violent restitution or old sacrifice stuff. Old trash stuff, just to keep the speed up. I mean you you you've got your thing and it's uh iconic, so it works. Um I'm curious, like so yeah, you said like after one day it starts to go. Maybe like three or four. Yeah, that's what I've noticed too. Three. Yeah. One day, get a little leeway, but two, three, three. four. One day it'll all go away. Man. <laughs> I feel like there's this really great violinist, I feel like, who said that if I miss one day, I notice. If yeah. I miss two days, the conductor notices. If oh, I miss yeah. three days, the audience notices. <laughs> so, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, kind of something it. along those lines. Uh, what about warming up? Like, do you just like sit down and just like just go in full speed, or do you need to warm up more? Uh, on tour, I guess I'm I'm well practiced, so I just kind of go in cold, pick up the guitar, and and go. Hopefully, the first song is kind of a warm up, and um, not blaze all blazing. Wow, that's impressive. But six feet under stuff is a little easier than Cannibal on the side, so that helps. Yeah, but it's yeah. still not like it's not like easy stuff. It's, it's still it's pretty speedy. Pretty, yeah, there is some speed in there. So, um, I I think that like yeah, that makes sense. If you're working on it every day, like you just have a routine that keeps your speed up, and that's just like a habit then yeah. the need to warm up into that becomes less, uh, it's like less important if it's, if that's kind of the baseline level that you're at on a regular yeah. basis. You know what's coming up, like studio work or, or tours, you'll start getting like from every other day to every day. That's another task cam thing, that little guitar trainer that you put MP3s into, just play along with that on your headphones or, or run it into a stereo. That's loaded with Razor and Exodus and what else? Probably Almond Brothers. <laughs> Not that it's fast, but it's fun. <laughs> I mean, that matters too. Yeah. Gotta have fun. Yeah. Is it still fun for you? Oh, yeah. I can't wait to get out there again because we toured last in the end of 2019 and then everything shut down. And then uh, the last album wasn't received very well, so maybe tours didn't pick up and then touring got insanely expensive so that happened and maybe that's why we're not talking till like 2025 for touring but like i said maybe we can blast out some short ones when the album comes out yeah yeah get yeah, some good it, uh i've noticed uh, like i'm curious your thoughts um I meet lots of vets that are that complain about it and don't won't say yeah i still think it's fun um why do you think that is and how have you kept it fun for yourself the traveling is just the best part i mean you end up in a little town in france and you get there at 10 a.m and i used to walk the whole town 
And then I figured out, hey, there goes a bus. And then um, that bus is coming right fast here. I just get on that and go into town. Mm -hmm. It's heading to the town. So that's the coolest part. I mean, if we play La Locomotive in Paris, it's right down the street from Jim Morrison's grave. So you just go right down there. Or if you're totally lost, just grab a fan and say, hey, take me to something cool, like the Eiffel Tower or whatever. Not to say all France, but everywhere, really. Netherlands, Germany, everywhere we go. I'm the one who goes into town early, and then I come back, and everybody's like, hey, where is everything? I'm like, oh, this is over here, and the high-tech shop's over there, and the disco's over there. <laughs> you can get something to drink or eat, get a coffee over here. Everyone knows to, to ask me where everything is. Do you, do you, uh, are you the type that like, if you were to stay at the venue all day, you'd start to go crazy a little? I mean, back in the cannibal days, I actually had a mountain bike. <laughs> America's so big and public transit sucks. So I get there super early on U.S. tours because you have a bus. So you park, grab your bike. I remember Portland, it's like there's four sections of Portland, and I saw all four of them before sound check. That's why Cannibal was like, I don't know where that guy goes all day. It's like, there's a whole town out there. Even if you go to, I had a gym membership, go to the gym, grab a shower, a little workout, or I would go to the library, or, you know, you know but yeah, I can't stay at the club all day. I'll go crazy. You know, like, I, I always notice on tours, there's like, there's like the crew of people who have to go into town and then the right. crew of people who never want to do anything. Right. They just want to hide. Yep. I'm usually in group B, but in my defense, um, I traveled a lot as a kid. Um, and Ooh. so for, by the time I was touring, it wasn't like my head wasn't in the see everything space but anyways like i have noticed that there is a crew of people always like the i will go crazy if i'm in this venue mm -hmm. just like doing nothing um yeah there's nothing there yeah but then one thing that uh, i think is uh I've, I've noticed it caused tension among bands is like if it's only one dude that wants to go into town and the rest of them don't um, that can cause, that can cause like weird rifts. Um, I think you don't want to, want to be around them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how do you, how do you get around that? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry, dude. I real I love you, man. Yeah. I love but you. I gotta guys. go. I mean, yeah. And at the end of the day, after the show, I'm tired out. So I go right into my bunk and go to sleep. So there you go. That's part two of <laughs> alienating the bear. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, as long as you say what you've been doing and say, hey, there's a whole world out there. If you're stuck at the abyss in Houston or something, then load-in hasn't even happened. The promoter's not even there, and there's nothing around. What are you going to do? Sit there? Yes. I, I think a lot of people's answer will be yes. <laughs> but you know what though i think what you're saying right now is kind of the secret to life in a band um so yeah, away from them get away from them and communicate yeah yeah that's true the communicate part so um you know with the hiatus that i took from playing and the band took a long time off i had a lot of time to think about what what caused all that and then while doing this podcast in urm podcast and talking to everyone who I spoke to was in a successful band. I had talked to them about like, what works? Why haven't you guys broken up? Like what, what's the deal? I know you've had rough times. Of course you've hated each other at times. Like, so what, what is it that keeps it going? Um, cause you don't have to do this. Uh, there are other things you could do with your lives and it's always down to communication. Um, because like every single band has had moments where they almost broke up. They've had moments where every member has hated every other member, like good times, bad times. Um, Physical fun. Yeah. Yeah. It, it all happens, but some bands 
get destroyed over it and others don't. Right. And what I've taken away from all the conversations I've had is that the ones who don't is because there's communication because the, those bad things are going to happen. Like you are going to, the fights will happen. All that stuff will happen. It's how you deal with it. That makes the difference. I think. Yeah. And I could have communicated a lot better back in the day with cannibal <clears throat> rather than just taking off and coming back for sound check. And then I think I would take off again <laughs> <laughs> And then come roll in on my mountain bike at showtime. <laughs> They'd be like, what the hell? <laughs> would they be scared that like they would be down a guitarist for a show? Yeah, show? yeah probably. <laughs> <laughs> if the town was that exciting, it was like, man, I'm going back into town. What time are we on? Okay, be back at 8.45. Later. <laughs> man, were you six feet under when Tally was? Uh, no. Okay. He was in my band for a while, and um, he does that too. Like, he he goes to town. I think he would bring a bike on tour, you know, and not say anything a lot of the time. And so he was never late for a show, though. He was always on time, and he always fucking killed it on stage. But there were several times where I was like, "Are we gonna have a drummer tonight?" (laughs) (laughs) And it's pretty good. You stay fit. It's like I had a bike. I think seven days into the tour, I weighed myself and I lost like 15 pounds. And I was like, well, okay, I'll keep this bike idea going. Yeah, I mean, that's, if you're doing that all day long, especially in Europe, um, yeah. that's definitely a lot of calories. Yeah, cobblestone and hills and mountains. And I got to go to this castle, but it's like 10 kilometers. What's a kilometer? I don't know. I'll try it. <laughs> And then the sweaty meat trays in uh, catering. Oh, catering. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, the clubs are better in Europe. Um, with the DSI tours, Glenn had burned out all the booking agents. So the clubs were mediocre. <laughs> Rough stuff. stuff. And kind of bad areas and nothing there. And the promoters didn't care. Another reason to not hang out. Yeah. Well, I think that as you tour more, like as it becomes uh like a career thing the the surroundings you find yourself in matter more and more i think when you're 21 and you're at that age where you could just pack pack through europe or something you don't care like you don't care if you're like waking up in random people's kitchens and you know that whole age where you would be okay with that that's the perfect time to start touring because that's what your tours are going to be like. That's the level you're going to be touring at most likely for the first several few years. And so that's when to do that stuff. Cause as you get older, uh, just waking up and random shitholes is not, uh, not as cool. There are certain clubs in America where they put you in the basement with black mold and, and rats and God knows what, and there's no shower and, Stuff like that. Are you like, what did I do with my life? <laughs> right. They had a pipe under the old 930 club in D.C. The pipe ran across the top of the dressing room and they wrote Rat 69 on it. Or Rat 66, sorry. And it was sure enough, pretty soon a rat went by. <laughs> over the- oh, God. That's hilarious. Hilarious and terrible. <laughs> right. And then you'll be somewhere in Kansas in the basement and it's like what's all that black shit on the walls in the bathroom and you're like black mold why are we in here yeah there are some places in Europe that you'll end up at that are nasty but by and large by and large you're not going to encounter that stuff as much the just the nasty nasty like the basement in Kansas covered in black mold not as much in Europe. It's at a higher standard in general. Every time we play Berlin, it's like, this is Berlin, capital of Germany, and we're in a shithole in a club <laughs> for some reason. So get out there, get a coffee, do something. There was this one place in Germany where, I think it was Germany or Austria, where maybe you've played there. It really did... F- has this like dorm for bands that really does feel a lot like a concentration camp. 
Um, yeah. Is it where like it is like the wooden beds, um, and it's like under the club in like a stone building. I remember it, that. Yeah. Totally covered in graffiti all over the bunks and like the walls and everything. But like it is very concentration camp ish. Like yeah. the like the wooden bunks are like this far apart. And it's like, I just think like, oh, if my grandparents could see me now. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, like, uh, I've been to that one. I think that's in Salzburg. The whole bunk area is like separate from the club. Like, yes. Up Little Hill. Yeah. Where's your favorite place to go? Where, like, if you have one place that is like on your rating system? Um, I guess anywhere in the Netherlands. Because it's like every city is a mini Amsterdam and public trans is great. Trams, trains, you're you're set to get around. So that, that's always cool. For me, it's Japan. I feel like touring there. Japan? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They, they kind of check off all the boxes. Yeah. For... In any arcade. It's like walk out the door and you're in an arcade. <laughs> yeah. It's it's pretty it's It's pretty amazing. I think. Yeah, so clean, and the intersections with like five hundred people coming at you either way. That's pretty cool. Yeah, totally. So don't what, feel afraid. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely don't feel afraid. So, in your opinion, how do you write better songs? Um, I don't know. This one, there was a lot of different approaches. Like some, like accomplice to evil deeds, just came to me in a dream. It was me and Corpse Grinder, and he was killing people in a shack in the woods, and I was helping him. And then when I woke up, it, uh, the hell, whole song was just in my head. Like, you will be my accomplice. Boom. That was the riff, and then right around that. Ascension was, uh, uh, I wanted to do something like Staring Through the Eyes of the Dead. Love that song. Just a little, a little chord thing to, to tie everything together. There's so many different techniques, like the whole thing will, will come to you, and if it doesn't, riff archive, if, uh, if you don't want to use that, put on a drum beat, so many different ways. Let's talk about when it does come to you. Is that, um, I guess, in terms of what the most rare or most common method? Uh, is yeah, usually the best stuff. Because I like Accomplice the Evil Deeds on the new album. And that, like I said, just came into my head while I was sleeping. And then I just laid it all down when I woke up. And is is that, nor is that like, does that happen often? Not really. If I have riff, yeah, I've tried that before with stuff that'll pop into my head and I just hum it into my phone. And I think I might have one for the next album, but uh those are the coolest because i always remember david bowie saying if it doesn't write itself in like five minutes it probably shouldn't be written <laughs> so, i know what he means yeah there's that and then there's structuring a whole thing which is which is fun too what do you what would you say is like the most common way for you to go about it um just grabbing a riff well, I don't know. Maybe it goes back to like talking with somebody about like how the internet and cable TV changed everything. And it was like, sure, we were into horror movies, but now there's like three or four cable channels that have true crime on all day. And I'll turn something on and there's a phrase. It's like, that's all I need. Like a couple words, like this guy killed this lady in the woods. And I'm like, perfect. It was like, I was watching hockey, and this guy tied the game up, and they went to commercial, and the uh, announcer goes, Mr. Bloody Guts ties it up at one. And I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah, just a phrase will get me going on. Actually, yeah, I start with a phrase and then a few words and lyrics. Uh, I forgot about the book of poetry that I read. If I write a whole thing of music and I don't have any lyrical ideas I'll just take a book of American poetry and just read it as the song's playing and certain lines will just settle right into the song so I'll have like fake lyrics for 
a while that fit, and then I have patterns to write to. So there's a million ways that I do it, and it's all old school and stupid. But well, it sounds to me like writer's block doesn't really happen that often. Too. No, there's a million ways to just put on a drum beat or find a drummer or put on a click. I don't know. Play on an acoustic. Steve from the side wrote the whole Stench of Redemption album on acoustic guitar and recorded it on a VHS tape and gave me the whole thing. <clears throat> and I'm like, how's this going to work? But it worked. It's like I watched it and learned all the riffs and we put it together <laughs> yeah. two weeks. That's amazing. That is a, a, and he probably started writing that on a, a piano because he's awesome on piano. It just goes to show, like, if you want to do it, you'll do it. I, you know, I hear people say, like, because Riff Hard is like, we've got the podcast, but it's also an online school for metal guitar players. And so oh, in the community, I'm like always talking to guitar players of all levels, like, People who just started, people who are fucking amazing, people who have been playing for like 20 years, but play like beginners. Like you get like all this massive spectrum and uh, I pay attention to a lot of what people have trouble with. Um, that's where a lot of these questions are coming from um, uh, or just questions I have personally um, for you. But one thing I've noticed when it comes to writing so I consider myself a writer more than a player. And like the playing side of it is like what I have to do to be able to play what I write. And so if it turns out that it's difficult, I have to practice more, but I'm not like a player for the sake of playing like some of these virtuoso. So like, I can't imagine not writing, but there are some people that in um, our community. So which makes me think there's a lot of people at large like this they say they can't write anything that every single time they sit down to write it's like they freeze and they have told themselves they can't write and i've always wondered like can you write a chord and then a chord after it if the answer is yes you can write so why don't you just do that like write a two chord pattern just one chord to the next to a drum beat and call it done a motorhead song. <laughs> exactly. Tomorrow, come back and add a third chord. or <laughs> uh, But, like, you can write. It just, I think that people um, stop themselves by thinking that it has to be the greatest thing ever written and, like, fully produced right, yeah, right. out the gate. Yeah. I have stuff that I'll never see the light of day. It's just dumb and fun and, and for, for my own enjoyment, I guess. Just stupid shit. But, uh, yeah, I wish I had a formula of, of endless riffs back, I don't know, 2000 or so. I, I would have been writing whole Cannibal Corpse albums, probably. That was what we would have been fighting about. <laughs> You're writing too much. <laughs> but, I mean, the point being, though, that, like, you have several ways to get the creativity started. Yep, a little late, but now it just, I can't stop. That's that's awesome. I think I actually think that that's what uh, what people should do is find different ways to get it going, mm. um, whatever that is. So for me, one thing that works really well is learning something new, not like a song by somebody, but like learning some concept, like like there's like you hearing something that. Um, a bunch of bands are doing that sounds wild like what is that thing and then just learn that thing like metric modulation or something just like something that i don't know how to do that sounds cool just learn it learn the concept like take a lesson with somebody and like have them show me that concept and then always the next day or two days later song will happen um uh, yeah totally yeah it's like there's there's things you can do when you have when you feel like the wells run dry there are steps you can take to spark it back up always you should, yeah. shouldn't have to feel writer's block yeah i know it, it affected me for a long time like you uh, pretty much all throughout bsi uh 
I guess I was intimidated by the material they had written, like probably the first two albums. So I was like, where do I even start? So it took me a couple of albums to get into trying to write for them. And then I, near the end of my time, I had a riff archive going and it was probably like 120 riffs. And I took it into practice and I played the whole thing and it was probably like 25 or 30 minutes and I played the whole thing, all the riffs. And then everybody stood around and was like, okay. Let's play the songs that we got. And I was like, what? Not one riff? <laughs> <laughs> I have them all written down. I know how they go. Do you like any of them? No comment. Well, I guess that gives you plenty of riffs for the next thing you do. Yeah. Pages and pages of riffs. I mean, so that's that's a, it's an interesting situation because... Um, I think that like becoming a writing member of a band is something a lot of people want to do. So, uh, when they didn't like anything, what was your, what was your thought process? Um, just right. I just overload them. And, uh, after I played all the riffs, I guess I decided to write complete songs and bring those in. I think, before I before I had Easy Drummer, I think I ran all the drum the drum tracks from To Hell with God onto like a mini disc player or something from the soundboard. So I had all of the drums edited and and finished just the drum track, and I cut those into loops. So I would write riffs to Steve's loops, and then write songs to that, and then take those in, and I got a few few songs going. <laughs> Like I could tell when I was trying to write or when I was supposed to write for DSI, I would try to write stuff that sounded like Legion, but it just doesn't come out right. It's like when I try to write stuff like Haunted for Six Feet Under, it just sounds like obituary. Mm-hmm. It's not even usable. It's like, okay, turn on the rap pedal and play some riffs and play a huge bar chord. Uh, it'll be perfect. And then I track it all and I'm like, sucks. Sounds like, sounds like obituary bad obituary so how how did you end up how do you end up writing for a project and having it sound appropriate um for six yonder or anything anything like like you because i mean basically so you're saying that like sometimes when you try to sound like what you think a band should sound like it doesn't come out right no no so how how like what's the like what is it that does make it come out right uh nothing can make it come out right it's just write it put it together i and i don't think i even had a multi-track in those days so it was kind of like drum loops and paste it together and see what can happen um that's the fun but you know that's back when we all lived in the same area, so I could always jam stuff with Steve. But it's different now. I have all the tools I need to, to write in an archive. And lyrically, oh yeah, I do uh, scratch vocals on the Six Feet Under songs just to show Chris where to sing. And eventually we were like, dude, your vocals smell like El Duce. And I was like, you know what? You're right. <laughs> so it's just the map. So, so basically, it sounds like the more you try to sound like something, the less, the less it works, and the more you just do your thing, the better, yeah. the better it goes. Yeah, yeah. Same thing in in DSI or Six Feet Under. Like, I'm not gonna write or try to write stuff like Haunted or Warpath because I can't, and I'm not sure people want to hear that. So, I, for this one, I just wrote what i was feeling and that's what works it seems to work yeah yeah yeah, that's that's so far that's a i think that's a good lesson for people um because because like like really like if you're trying to write something that someone else already wrote it's kind of hard to get into somebody else's headspace yeah i kind of realized that if i took all the autopsy rips from a song and then tried to write a so- the same song it would sound different <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah totally it's the same with mixing man um 
you can steal, not steal, you can copy, uh, it's not stealing, uh, but, you know, you can try to copy people's settings uh, sure. on a mix, and it's not going to sound like their mix. No, no, and I have proof of this because we've been doing Nail the Mix for like almost 10 years now. You would think that after doing that every single month for like 10 years, that one of our students would be able to do a mix that sounds like the original, especially after having watched all the videos where you see what the dudes are doing. Never. It's never happened. Ever. No. Not once. Not once. And we get like in our mix competition, we get like hundreds if not thousands submitted every month like yep. if it was possible to copy like really copy uh it would have we would have discovered it by now i think um and without like cattle decapitation yeah it's just you can't be anybody but yourself i think with mixing and writing sure mm -hmm. for better or for worse i guess yeah that's like drama gog for drums. It's like, well, okay, we're going to put our drums in here and then turn them into somebody else. But still, it sounded like Steve. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, like, look, drama gog or any sound replacement, like, still, even if you're using the same samples that other people have used, it's still your ears that are making the decision of how to work it in the mix, and it's going to be your tastes, good or bad, your ears, good or bad, that are going to determine like how it finally ends up. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen Scott Burns sampling drums back in the day, but he would do them one at a time through the sampler, and obviously we couldn't move kicks back then. So it was still the drummer. It was just a kick from maybe Donald Tardy. Or... Mm -hmm. I've heard the stories. Or just watch, watch the meter as the tape was rolling, making sure every kick went through the sampler. <laughs> Man, that man. that's something I would do. <laughs> man, those, man, when when um when I did the I did a side project with Sean Reinhart like in two thousand nine, um, and that was like a huge opportunity to ask him about what it was like, you know, in those early days, early Morris Sound days, and um those drum techniques and he told me all about that and it was, it's just yeah. like those old school extreme metal engineers are fucking heroes i know <laughs> the, the shit they did back then wow harris johns and, and all those guys doing the sodom and past one albums and you know scott and tom and, yeah uh and another interview it was like oh it was the mystique about morris sound and it was like that eh really just the building. It's just all the people that were in it at the time. Yeah, totally. And what, uh, two studios going at the same time, obituaries in one, Morbid Angels in the other, and in the lobby, there's Incubus, Cannibal, and Deicide guys. And out on the patio, there's God knows who. There's Did Zork. you say Incubus? Yeah. That's an that's an interesting mix of people. Oh, the Cajun, the Cajun band, uh, Incubus. They were thrash. Oh, okay. Not Incubus, the... <laughs> Nope. Okay, I was going to say, like, interesting. That's a uh, little Brandon Boyd and Trey hanging out. Um, yeah, they changed their name, but I forgot <laughs> what it was. But, uh, yeah, they moved to Tampa to record at Morris Sound. But, you know, the thing that uh, recording studios, when people go to sell them, they're hit with a very harsh reality that the resale value on them is shit. And it's because the thing that's valuable about a studio is the people in it and what they do with it. It's not any of the stuff that's in there. I mean, there is a monetary value to the gear, but not, not like anything compared to what the people bring to it. Sure. Yeah. People would come over from Japan to go to Morris Island and they're like, where, where is everything? Where is everybody? I'm like, they just do commercial jingles now, but you could go around with a brass mug tonight and probably see all of them <laughs> there. Yeah. The local metal bar. Yeah, I mean, it's just people. Is yeah. It? it was classic. Now, I like watching the videos when D.S. and I would come in to uh, Morris Island because they were freaks. Steve looked like a wizard. 
and Eric and Brian were just so funny back then. Probably still are, but I haven't seen them in years. <laughs> Probably said more sound. So, uh, yeah, building with people. It can be anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Was, was the scene more, uh, were the personalities in the scene more extreme back then? Yeah, definitely. Everybody was younger and partying, and I don't know how they brought all the alcohol into the studio with them, but it was crazy. Yeah, that was, as a fan, because I was a teenager in the early 90s, as a fan, it seemed like it was way crazier on the, you know, on the making records side of it than my experience of it in the 2000s. Oh, sure. And even farther back, like early Amon shows before they were deified with blood and guts and everything. So there was that. Fun. Was it was it like cool among members of the scene back in those days? Yeah, totally cool. It's like we would get done recording, and obituary was very close to the studio then. So we go watch them rehearse, and not knowing they were rehearsing the Cause of Death album, so that was cool. Um, but yeah, everything was close and cool, and everybody got along and. But try to put all those bands on one tour, and probably wouldn't happen. Yeah, makes sense. Back in, back in the day, they did it in Europe. What is this ticket I've got? It's like a Morbid Angel, Cannibal. This is 1994. So we've got Morbid Angel, Cannibal. Who else is on here? Unleash, Samael, and Disgust. <laughs> wow, nice. Back together. That is a cool lineup. 94, and it's like a lot of them had five killer bands. One was like Death, Pestilence, Cannibal, Napalm Death, and like Dismember. One tour. It's badass. I don't know how they got away with it. Well, you said Europe? Yeah. I mean, the, that's probably how. That's when everybody could share a bus. And they had yeah. like three men on one bus. Like Vader is on a bus with Immolation and and us and they're like no problem the bulks were like i don't know <laughs> 10 inches to get into your bulk because there were three high on the bus like 22 bunks on a bus i mean those are rolling meat wagons basically yeah was, was there like a friendly competition among the bands i don't think so didn't really it was just like a big party a rolling party and get to the venue and but i mean in florida in the florida scene oh no i don't think so uh we arrived late so we would only go down to record until about 94 and even by then it was kind of like eh, nobody's hanging out as much but uh it was always the morbid angel gsi thing but it was just like friendly competition we'll make fun of you you make fun of us it's yeah, I mean, I I think that like the that stuff gets so blown out of proportion by in press. It I I feel at least my experience of metal is that most musicians in metal are metal fans, and when there's a band that does something sick, they're fans of it also, and if they happen to be friends they want to more than anything they want to know what they're doing how are they getting so much notoriety <laughs> yeah and how or why what is that thing they're doing that sounds so sick or like whatever like that's what i've always noticed that whatever like yeah there's some bands that beef but like overall the any competition is more just like uh wow they really got sick on that record we need to be even sicker now yeah. Which is a good thing. Yeah. Like, not Kron sounds like autopsy, but don't we need like 10 more bands that sound like autopsy? <laughs> <laughs> I love Necrot. That's why they're good. Yeah. I mean, we could always use more great bands. But, uh, Jack, I think it's a good place to end the podcast. Uh, oh. I want to thank you very much for taking the time to hang out. My pleasure. My pleasure having you on. And, uh, Good luck with the record, man. I hope it goes well, and uh, 
you, you 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 get the you get to get out like you want. Right. Get out and see the city. Yep. I'm sure it'll fun. happen. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Uh-huh. Thank you, man. Take care.